The Sony a6500 is a $1,400 mirrorless camera capable of recording 4K video and taking fantastic stills. It has sensor stabilization, a touchscreen, an electronic viewfinder, and a whole host of other features that make it just a, a really great all-around camera for people shooting video and stills together. If you already have the camera, I suggest you go here, stp.io slash tutorials, because we have a full tutorial waiting for you there and we'll show you how to use it. And you shouldn't watch reviews for cameras you already have. That'll teach you how to actually use them. A lot of people wonder why Sony released a new camera less than a year after the predecessor, the A6300. And I have an anecdote about that because I went to the press event for the Sony A6300 and Sony is a great manufacturer because they were sincerely interested in finding out the flaws in the camera. And when we discovered those flaws as reviewers, they wanted us to publish reviews about them because they knew that those public reviews would help drive the engineering of the replacement. And they genu genuinely wanted not to get great reviews, but to make a better product and to get that sort of feedback. And they really did respond to their to our feedback. The A6300 was a great camera, but it had lots of problems. Like if you tried to shoot sports with it, the camera would buffer really quickly and then you couldn't review your pictures or do anything while it was writing. They fixed that. Now you can just shoot to your heart's content and pretty quickly be able to review your pictures. It's amazing. We complained about the lack of a touchscreen. So they gave it a touchscreen. That's great. We complained that it overheats and they didn't completely fix that. This camera still will overheat when it's recording 4K video, but it takes much more to make it overheat. And in fact, most of the time it's probably gonna be okay. I complained about the lack of a thumbstick and well, it still doesn't have a thumbstick because they seem to have constrained themselves to working in the same physical form factor, probably just an engineering uh, restriction in order to get the camera out quickly. It doesn't have a thumbstick, but now they have a touch and drag feature that allows you to change the focusing point by dragging your thumb on the screen there. And that works okay. So that's, a a pretty amazing way to address complaints from reviewers. And so thank you, Sony, for being open to listening to feedback and actually addressing it. And for the people who complain that they no longer have the most recent camera when they got the A6300, the A6300 is still doing all the same stuff. You now have an option. Sure, it costs a little bit more, but it's a better all-around camera. And if you don't care about the 1400 bucks, then get the A6500 and just upgrade. Otherwise, we'll talk about what those differences are, exactly what they might mean to you, and whether or not it's worth it. We'll also compare it to uh, a bunch of other cameras from Olympus, Panasonic, Canon, and Fuji. First up, one of the biggest changes is they added sensor stabilization to the camera. Sensor stabilization reduces handshake without having to have a lens that's stabilized. Most of the time, stabilization is implemented in the lens. This is great. This means you can put a fast, unstabilized prime on it and have a stabilized lens. It means you could get a Canon adapter and stick that amazing Sigma 18 to 35 on there, get pretty good autofocus and have it stabilized for low light work. And while it's a little unbalanced because that lens is so heavy, it becomes an amazing combination. Same applies for that amazing Sigma 50 to 100 F1.8. So you have the options of good glass and it all becomes stabilized. Fantastic, thank you Sony for doing that. I wish Canon and Nikon and Fuji would follow suit and start building in sensor stabilization. It's the best as like a technology I can't live without anymore. The controls on this camera are basically unchanged. They did beef up the buttons a little bit. So they did what they could again with this engineering restriction of not changing the physical form factor. The controls, however, are still among my least favorite of all cameras in this segment. You can see they're quite little and fiddly. They're prone to being hit accidentally. Uh, the buttons aren't necessarily where you wanna hit them. Things like the record button are still really hard to hit. Uh, we end up putting a little dab of Sugru on there on other cameras so that we can hit it regularly. They, there is no dedicated exposure compensation dial that's marked like there is on the A7R2. And if you use a camera like the Fuji X-T2 or really any of these other cameras, you'll begin to realize just how great the controls are, are uh, on them. Now. As I mentioned before, the touchscreen here helps out a lot as far as improving the controls. So Sony did what they could. However, the, the controls and usability of the camera are still, I think, its biggest weak point and one of the reasons that I might pick up any one of these other cameras over it. People tend to fixate on things like the image quality, the video quality, we'll talk about that. But in the real world, I feel like the controls and the usability cam of the camera make a bigger difference in, in your 
results because being able to rapidly and reliably change settings and not have settings change automatically can be a bigger deal. They also did not change the battery on it. The battery on all of these Sony cameras is absolutely minuscule and it's completely maddening. The battery fails rapidly and regularly. If I go out for a day of shooting, like if we're on vacation or whatever, I travel with three fully charged batteries. Even then I can end up going through all those three batteries. So that means when I get back to the hotel, I have to remember to charge all three batteries or the next day, if I only charge two of them, then I know I'm running out of batteries pretty uh, before the end of the day. It does support USB charging. So if you have a charger for your phone, you can hook it up here and keep it charged. And that makes things so much easier. I wish every camera manufacturer would do that. I do hope in the A6600 or whatever, they will finally change the form factor and give me a bigger battery. Another real weakness of it is the back button focusing. If you're a DSLR user thinking about switching over to a mirrorless camera, back button focusing on this is, is difficult because of the slightness of the button. Um, nonetheless, it, it can be done, but we found it a little bit hard to control. Eye detection autofocus on this works fantastically. The, this and the A7R2 are the best at finding the eye for portrait shooting and really locking in focus. And that makes portraits an absolute breeze. It's so much easier than having to move a focus point around and find the eye. Uh, however, to activate eye detection autofocus, you have to push this center button here. And you can see how I have to hold my hand in order to hit that center button. That's the default setting anyway. So a lot of people will reassign that button to assign eye detect autofocus to um, a button up here on the top or a button on the back here, or this uh, replace the back button autofocus with the eye detect autofocus. And that does work better. Nonetheless, I still wish they would find a better scheme for eye detect autofocus, either have it running all the time, which I know might require additional processor power, or just give me better control so that I can more precisely and easily activate it without moving my hand in an uncomfortable way. The touch and drag autofocus, uh, the touch and drag allows you to change the autofocus point by moving your thumb here. And that's really useful when you have your eye up to the viewfinder. However, uh, it has a real weakness in the way Sony has implemented it. It does not work nearly as well as it does on either the Olympus cameras that sort of originated that technology or even the Canon EOS M5. And the reason it doesn't work well is the touchscreen here is extremely low quality. I would say I have to touch the screen an average of twice to get it to, to work. Quite often I'll touch it and it will miss, or I will need to uh, push it a little bit harder and push it again. And you really, really realize this when you go to actually type on the little keyboard when maybe you're logging into a network or logging into their app uh, department. The touch screen is just, it's just flaky and unreliable. It feels like if you used a Palm Pilot in the 90s, that's what it feels like. I think... My guess as to the engineering challenge here is that Sony didn't want to change the screen from the A6300 to minimize the re-engineering they had to do. So they layered something on top of it that would add a touchscreen capability to it. And I've never felt like touchscreens really varied too much from camera to camera, but the touchscreen on this is it's frustrating to use. So that's something that I hope they address in a future version. Nonetheless, it does work. It's it's just a little bit flaky and a little bit frustrating and it does impact how you use the camera. Sometimes when you're using touch and drag to change the autofocus points, you'll just miss and you'll have to do it a couple of times. And if you're shooting sports or something, that means you just might miss the shot if it doesn't take the very first time. With practice, you do get better at it though, so it is workable. The viewfinder is among the best for mirrorless cameras. This is the electronic viewfinder that we see up here. I love the fact that it's on the left side of the camera, like a rangefinder. That means that it doesn't smash against my nose. I know some people prefer to use their left eye. If you use your left eye, it's almost impossible to do. You might be happier with a DSLR style camera that has the viewfinder in the middle. But for those of us who favor the right eye, most people do. I think it's absolutely great. It's not as crystal clear and bright as the Olympus EM1 Mark II or the Fuji X-T2 or even the EOS M5. Nonetheless, it is a good and usable viewfinder. It just doesn't have that like better than life quality to it. The screen on the back here is, as I mentioned, is a touchscreen. And I feel like when Sony added, you can see how marked up it is with fingerprints and stuff. It kind of perpetually has this worse than any screen I've ever had on a camera. I feel like this layer that adds the touchscreen to it has greatly reduced the viewability of the camera, especially in sunlight. And in fact, I found it to be impossible to use on a sunny day outside. 
even in the shade, whether you're in the sun or the shade, even if you cover it with your hand like that, you just can't really make out the screen. It's what you will instead see is a reflection of your hand as you're trying to hold your hand over it. You will not be able to make out the screen. It's extremely hard to use in bright light. That can be managed because you also have the viewfinder. So as long as you're comfortable holding your eye up to it and using that, no problem at all. But if you're the type who always uses the back screen, if you are coming from using a smartphone and you tend to hold your camera out like this, you're going to find it hard to use. If you frequently work from a tripod and you want to be able to tilt the screen out or hold it down like that. Again, it's fine for night photography. It's found fine even on like a dim day or indoors, but outside in full sunlight, it's, it's practically unusable. The A6300 was actually better at that or any of these other cameras seem to have screens that work better in full sun. The focusing on it is improved over the A6300 and among the best in class. For things like tracking moving subjects, it works extremely well. The eye detection focusing works better than anything else. So if you're thinking about a focusing system for portraits, it's absolutely fantastic. And though I mentioned it's clumsy, the touch and drag to change autofocus points is useful and does uh, drastically improve the usability of the camera over the, the previous generation, the A6300 that required you to kind of push these directional pads around to change your autofocus point, which took far too long and really made it almost uh, impossible to use in a lot of different sports photography scenarios. The image quality of it is essentially unchanged since the A6300, which was essentially unchanged since the A6000. But the good news is that it's best in class. It's absolutely fantastic for an APS-C sensor. So there's nothing really to worry about there. We never had any complaints about the image quality. If you want to see a detailed overview of how it compares to other cameras, including full frame, frame cameras, watch our A6300 review. I will just add that at $1,400, it's very close to the price of full frame cameras like the Sony A7 Mark II. You will get better image quality out of those. You'll have about half as much noise at a given ISO. And especially if you're using Sony's full frame G master lenses, you'll get sharper and more detailed results. So this camera has better autofocusing than say an A7 Mark II. Uh, but uh, the A7, R A7 Mark II is going to produce better images if that is your primary concern. You might also look at a bigger camera like a Nikon D610, which also has full frame. The video quality on it, is again, essentially unchanged as near as I could tell from the A6300. However, the A6300 had just remarkable video quality. And in fact, it's kind of a benchmark for what an APS-C camera can do. It beats a lot of full frame 4K cameras, including the Nikon D500. Uh, well, that's not full frame, but it beats it. The Nikon D5, the Canon 1DX Mark II, the Canon 5D Mark IV, it, despite its full smaller sensor, has actually far better video quality than all of those. It also has better low light video quality than the uh, amazing Panasonic GH4. The video quality, absolutely astounding. And the fact that the camera has a touchscreen now dramatically improves its usability because you can touch to focus. Focusing while recording is, is workable. It's not that bad. So you can change focusing points and, and use that video. The focus tracking is not as good as the Canon EOS M5 or the other Canon cameras with dual pixel autofocus. However, the video quality is vastly, vastly better, especially since Canon doesn't offer any 4K cameras that use as many pixels as this does. So the actual video quality itself is pretty much unbeatable. However, we found that the camera will still overheat. The first time we used it to record something, we got the overheating warning icon in less than five minutes. And then the entire camera shut down at about seven or eight minutes. And that was indoors in this studio at 68 degrees with the panel flipped open and doing everything that we can. Now, you're going to see a lot of different varying results about this because everybody likes to test this. And some people will say it doesn't overheat for two hours. Other people like us have it overheat very quickly. And it's, it's hard for me to narrow down exactly why that happens or how it can be pre prevented. I've found just a distinct lack of consistency, consistency in how quickly this and the A6300 overheat they will overheat sometimes in five minutes and then the same camera will overheat uh, after an hour of recording. And uh, my friend Max Yurov, along with my friend Jordan uh, from the Camera Store TV, compared five different cameras, some A6300, some A6500, and kind of found that out too. Even in the exact same conditions, they got varying results with how long they continued to record. 
Uh, so do check out his video at this link here and you can get a second opinion on that. But the summary is it's inconsistent. Even with a single camera, it's going to be inconsistent. And what that means is as you're trying to shoot video, you don't know when it's going to fail and overheat or not. If you're out in bright sunlight, it will definitely fail faster. But as we said, in cool environments, indoors, in the shade, it will still fail. And that makes it hard for me to recommend for anybody to use uh, for, especially for an A-roll camera that you need to rely on. But even for a B-roll camera, it can be really stressful. And we've had videos ruined because we tried to film with these things and then it fails and we have to go scramble and get some other camera and change of all of our plans. So if you want to be able to record little bits of your travel, two, three minutes at a time, no problem. Go for it. It will produce amazing, beautiful results. If you want to record your uh, kid's soccer game and it goes for an hour, you should find a different camera because it will work sometimes and it will fail other times. And that's going to be really frustrating. One of the biggest uh, problems with the Sony APS-C lineup is the limited number of good quality lenses. Now, they have more lenses than the Canon EOS lineup, but they have far fewer lenses than Micro Four Thirds does, and the lenses that they have are not up to the quality of the Fuji APS-C lenses. The APS-C lenses that Sony offers are mostly consumer lenses, like this 18-105 to F4 lens that we have here. It's a great lens and we use it for professional stuff but as far as the, the sharpness and durability of it it's not up to what we would consider to be professional standards and if you put it side by side with the fuji xt2 you will see very distinct differences in sharpness now you can put on full frame g master lenses on it and you will get good results however you're paying a lot for those g master lenses and you're using very little of them also, those lenses are big and heavy, and the way this camera is designed, they those lenses throw this camera completely off balance. So I can't really recommend buying this specifically to use with the full-frame G Master lenses. Instead, what I hope is that Sony will once again take my feedback and start to develop some G Master APS-C lenses to better take advantage of what could be an amazing sports and general uh, camera. For detailed information about why those full-frame lenses don't uh, you don't get the full quality out of full frame lenses with an APS-C body, but like this, visit this link, sdp.io slash ffcrop. I will give a couple of examples based on DxO Mark data uh, as they measure sharpness for the G Master lenses on, well, the A6000 body, which has similar image quality to this, and the Sony A7R II. You can see with the quite expensive 24-78 F2.8 G Master, DxO Mark measured a level of detail of 13 perceptual megapixels from the A6000, whereas from the A7R2, they measured 28 perceptual megapixels. Now, the A7R2 does have 42 megapixels compared to 24 megapixels, so that's a factor, but you can see that you're not getting that much detail at all out of your little A6500. Makes a big difference to go up to that full frame. Similar results when you look at the 7800 F2.8 G Master, the A6500 produces only 14 perceptual megapixels of detail, whereas the A7R2 produces a full 38. So more than twice the amount of detail you'd be getting by upgrading to a full frame body. It's something to consider as you're allocating your budget. At some point, you're going to want to jump up to a full frame body uh, to really utilize those lenses. And if you're planning to stick with the APS-C world, if you don't have the budget for full frame, maybe instead you should look at the Fuji X-T2, which does have high quality native lenses. For detailed information about how to interpret DxO Mark and which of the data is useful and which of it should be completely disregarded, because some of it should be disregarded, visit this link here where I provide a detailed overview of how to best use DxO Mark. The wireless capabilities in it are useful for transferring pictures to your smartphone so that you can quickly share them on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, social networking. They're also useful for remotely controlling the camera in case you want to see a live feed of the screen. Maybe you're recording yourself for a video. You can see the screen does not flip forward. It's not a selfie screen. You could use your phone and Wi-Fi to do that, even though it takes, it takes some amount of time to set up. So it's not as convenient as a screen that flips forward. I found the wireless to be good. It's very good. It sets up fairly quickly and reliably. It's certainly better than Nikon SnapBridge, and it's among Canon, uh, which also has a good app. It works reliably. Um, they also have an app that you can get from their app store that will automatically transfer pictures to your smartphone when you turn the camera off. 
on iOS, this was not a good experience because on iOS and iPhone, it you have to go, you have to turn the camera off and then go to your iPhone, manually connect to this wireless network, um, and then launch the, the Sony app in order to transfer those automatically in the background. So basically there is no automatic transfer for you. And if you have an iPhone, I would completely disregard that feature until Apple some maybe releases an update that will allow that to work better. I wouldn't keep my fingers crossed. But if you have an Android phone, that transfer happens automatically. You can shut this camera off and it will transfer the pictures automatically to your phone so that they're ready and waiting for you. And you can instantly put them on Instagram without having to sort through the pictures or manually connect to a wireless network. It all works better with an Android phone, basically. I have a few minor gripes that I want to complain. Um, now, if you watch my EOS M5 review, I had a long list of gripes. I don't have much to complain about with the A6500 at all, um, besides those things that they didn't fix. One thing that I will complain about is there is no built-in time-lapse feature. If you want a time-lapse feature, you have to go into the App Store, which is okay. The App Store works, but you have to create an account on this website, and it's all to very time-consuming to use and... Once you do get in there, you have to then pay $10 to add a time-lapse feature. That's a feature that's built into every other camera. And I just feel like, just give us the time-lapse thing. It's also rather clumsy to use. Like it shuts down the regular camera OS and boots up this weird time-lapse OS. For some of us, time-lapses are things we do all the time. And I'd like it to be integrated in like it is on every other camera. If you're comparing this against the Sony a6300, which comes in at a lower price point, the previous generation of this, the Sony a6300 is going to be almost as useful for things like landscape photography, um, product photography, casual photography, it's okay. The biggest differences are going to be that the Sony a6300 actually has a better rear screen for use in bright light. The screen is very difficult to see. However, this camera is better in almost every way. Uh, every other way it has much better focusing it does have a touch screen which is great the touch and drag is very useful for changing focusing points if you're shooting sports and action the buffering works much better it allows you to uh, shoot a large number of pictures continuously and then go back and review your pictures or change settings it's just a better real world camera for shooting sports um, the overheating isn't eliminated but it overheats less frequently and less quickly so the overheating situation is is much, much improved. So overall, we're happy with the upgrade from the A6300 to the A6500, and we would recommend it to people who are trying to solve one of those problems, especially sports shooters. Versus the Fuji X-T2 over here, the X-T2 is really kind of my favorite grab-and-go camera. It's about $1,600, so it's about $200 more than the A6500. But in my opinion, it has vastly better controls that allow you to more easily and reliably change settings. I find it to be just fun to use because of these great dials. Also, as I've mentioned before, the Fuji F28 zooms are absolutely fantastic and they produce incredibly sharp and professional results. It lacks a touchscreen, which is a constant frustration with me. I really wish it had it. And the wireless uh, app isn't quite as flexible as the Sony's, but nonetheless, it does get the job done. Overall, I would definitely recommend people who are general shooters and travel shooters spring for the uh, spring the extra 200 bucks for the xt2 the one of the reasons you wouldn't do that is if you really liked the touchscreen or if you wanted to be able to touch to change the autofocus when you're recording video or stills you obviously don't have that capability however the screen here is much more visible in bright light either way they're both really good uh, cameras for general video and stills shooters versus the EOS M5. I'm going to recommend the a6500 over it just about all the time. Granted, it does cost $400 more, but it has 4k video and the video quality is vastly better. Um, the a6500 has sensor stabilization, which the EOS M5 lacks. The EOS M5 has electronic stabilization only when recording video, but that's like providing, adding in one of those software-based stabilizers in post. It's not actually moving the sensor, and it won't help you take long exposures handheld. Uh, also, the M5 has uh, a much more limited selection of lenses, very poor selection of native lenses for it. The M5 does have a selfie screen that flips down, and that can be really useful if you hold the camera out like this and want to be able to see, see yourself. However, 
that selfie screen flips down from the bottom, so it's unusable on a tripod. Nonetheless, it's still good when you're hand holding it. I also want to mention the Panasonic G85, which is a powerful camera that includes many of the features of the A6500. It has sensor stabilization, 4K video, and it's actually a little bit less expensive than the A6500. It's a micro four thirds camera, so it has a smaller sensor, but you can completely make up for that with the wide variety of faster and higher quality micro four thirds native lenses. So you're using lenses designed for that format and they have nice fast zooms like F2.8 zooms. Um, so I feel like you can actually get better image quality out of the G85 until that is Sony decides to make some higher quality APS-C glass. So if you're looking for video in particular, I'd steer you towards the, the G85 because it has almost all those features and it has a screen that flips out from the side. Now this is my G7, so it's not a G85, but they're made by the same company and similar in many different ways. The G7 is also worth looking at if you're looking at a video camera. It happens to be less expensive. It doesn't have the sensor stabilization, but it's also a great 4K video camera. Versus the Olympus EM1 Mark II, an absolute monster of a mirrorless camera with just a huge grip and it's absolutely built like a tank. I really like the M1 Mark II. However, I think the price point is kind of hard to justify at a full two grand. It has sensor stabilization. It has 4K. It makes great images. And as I said, I feel like the micro four thirds lenses are uh, higher quality micro four thirds lenses are available than APS-C Sony lenses. And therefore, if you or the type who wants the sharpest lenses, if you want to be able to do shallow depth of field and such, you can actually probably get better results out of micro four thirds. Even though the sensor sizes are smaller, you don't need to judge everything based on sensor size. If you want to pick up one of those cameras, you can use the links that I put below them. That, that helps me out a little bit. Please subscribe for more free videos, including reviews, tutorials, and a live show every Thursday at five o'clock where we review your photos. And of course, you can check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography, which teaches you the ins and outs of taking fantastic photos, not just the details of things like megapixels and image quality, but composition, storytelling, lighting, planning, mood, expression, posing, uh, all that stuff I'll help you out with. And that's going to make way more of a difference in upgrading from one camera to the next. So send, spend 10 bucks, go to Amazon and search for Tony Northup or go right to our store. We also have paperback books that ship worldwide from our store here. And if you get into post-processing, I have books on Lightroom and Photoshop and a whole book, a photography buying guide that teaches you the ins and outs of all these different camera systems and lenses and will definitely save you thousands of thousands of dollars. Thanks and bye.